Hello there, campers. Can you believe it's the penultimate episode of Virtual Campfire Stories for Grown-Ups? Neither can I. Where does the time go? No one knows. Only the wheeling sun that heats the earth to life. You are welcome to listen to this story and all the others anytime you wish. Find them in our Virtual Campfire Stories for Grown-Ups playlist on the Library YouTube channel. Without further ado, I'm Librarian Lily, and I will once again be your narrator. Let's begin. Today's story is The Gondoliers by Karen Russell, from her short story collection, Orange World. Part 1. The Chorus Dr. Glim was supposed to be my last fare of the evening, but when I am a quarter mile from home, I hear a man coughing on South Jetty, and against my better judgment, I am drawn down the foamy water of a side canal toward the rattling sound. Through the keyhole spaces in the mangroves, I can see a tall figure in a long, green slicker pacing on the jetty. He cries out when he sees me, flagging me down with his whole body. The sky is two-toned, fiery pink above the green horizon line. It's too late for a passenger, even a regular, someone trusted and familiar. A happy story ends here. A responsible gondolier pulls homeward. I can hear my sisters doing just that. They are singing in a wide canal, three boats pulling into a line. Echoes fly into the birdcage of my sternum. Even miles apart, we are always audible to one another. When I am twenty feet from the jetty, I raise the pole and wave it slowly at him. Power gathers in my cracked heels and pulses upward. Will I take him to his destination? We are equals in our suspense. What luck, cries the man. Are you going north? Push your hood up. I want to see who's asking. Sunset is less than an hour away, and he won't find another boat if I refuse him. His fear reaches out to stroke my cheek. It makes me feel tenderly toward the white-faced old man. Also, powerful. On the polling platform, I am almost eye-level with him. Old, I guess that's always relative. Older than me, I should say. Thirty? Forty? But perhaps I look old to him. Thank God you spotted me. Please, I'm in a real jam. He keeps a finger trained on me, as if at any moment I might disappear. The boat I hired never showed. His voice catches. Now that I am closer, I can hear how deeply this rattle has lodged itself into his body. Even at sunset, it's eighty degrees, but this stranger is shivering. His desperation perfumes the air, a soaking, underarm smell. Under the jutting limestone, as if in a secret mimicry of him, a thousand tiny, sharp wavelets jump and fall. He is nervous. I am making him nervous. Power whips through me again, and I almost laugh it feels so good to be alive on the polling platform. Song gathers under my navel, and I make no effort to contain it. Ooh! I watch him jump. Miss, won't you help me? Miss. I smile. That's a first. I have two names. Janelle Picaro and Blister. My mother gave me the first name, my sister's the latter. Nobody has ever addressed me so formally. Can you take me to the seawall in Bahia Rosa? A visitor to New Florida usually wants to see the jungle, the ruins. Locals hire us to pull them to the fishing nets, the floating markets. We take children to the school in the morning, weaving around the shadows of the wrecked cruise liners, helping them up the gangplanks to their classrooms. Nobody asks to go to the seawall. My sisters won't pull within a mile of the black buoys. We don't go there. We? The man opens an antique red wallet. But I'm asking you. Two miles away, behind the tangled red mangroves, home calls to me. My sisters and I live inside the ruins of a seaplane hangar built out of metal and glass a hundred years ago. By now, my sisters will be rinsing the salt water from their gondolas. Only my boat slip will be empty. I can hear the twangy echo of my absence in the hangar, a hollow note that gives me a queer twist of pleasure in my gut. Money can make sense out of almost anything, can't it? I watch his black thumbnail riffle the paper. It's magic that way, but no amount of money can turn a trip to the seawall into a sane journey. The seawall was erected by the Army Corps as a last-ditch attempt to protect the city from getting swallowed. It failed, of course, and thousands drowned. We call the silent bay that surrounds it Bahia Rosa, a pretty name for a rippling nowhere. 
Once, the green lights used by fishing boats draped the ocean in a miasmic fog, so bright it was visible from outer space. Now, reddish blooms of a fish-killing algae cover the entire bay. Bahia Rosa gets blamed for everything from cancer to bad dreams. A desire to go there suggests a highly contaminated assessment of risk-reward. Smugglers supposedly meet at the seawall, a rumor I did not much credit until this moment. Please, miss, I'm falling behind schedule. He offers me a stupendous sum of money, more than I make in a month as a gondolier on Bahia del Oro. Double that, I tell him. As we pull away from the jetty, I hear a faint, awful rumbling, but I can't decide if this is the true echo of some future disaster or only my guilt. This man is sick, and he has no supplies, no food. But if my last fare wants me to leave him in the middle of the sea, that's his business. My business is transportation. He didn't hire me to ask questions. Only a lunatic or a criminal goes to the seawall. That's what Viola would say. Viola is my oldest sister, the most responsible of us, and in some ways, the most guileless. She wouldn't understand the humming in my body that begins when I hear the words Bahia Rosa. I have been wanting to make this trip myself, and I'm grateful to have the stranger's money as my alibi. Once I deliver him to the seawall, I'll have hours to myself in the unmappable dark. A part of me is already flying into the future, where I am rid of this person, free and alone, and swimming under the blind moon of Bahia Rosa. His coughing jolts me back into the boat, and I feel sick myself for a miserable moment, wondering if I should turn back. It's a relief to pull clear of the mangroves and join up with the fast-moving current. We go rushing into the wide bay, where the echoes make my decisions for me. Two birds, one stone. The old, brutal saying returns to me out of the blue. I can't remember where I first heard it. I house thousands of these fragments, echoes of unknown origin, words that went skipping across mines for centuries, apparently, before sinking into mine. The current races us through the ruins of Old City, where a teenage boatman drowned just last week. My sisters and I have a monopoly on this territory. Even locals lose their way here, where the debris rearranges itself in a slowly turning kaleidoscope, the garbage mountains always changing shape. The glare of the sun is intense at six o'clock, splintered around the concrete grottos. We enter the shade of a domed ceiling, pulling around the brass and silver letters. My I cl et Riam. Former home of the phony night sky where hundreds of translucent fish now sway, nibbling at the algae on the auditorium walls. Rows of spongy seats glide just below us, a reef of huge brown scallops, staircases that move like our singing does, lunging in two directions at once. Ooh. Middle C to E minor. Guys, this is just Lily for a minute. I know that wasn't middle C to E minor. I just, I couldn't, uh, so my bad. Back to the story. Orange to pink to blue, the song sweeps in front of the boat. I crutch around the drowned beams that fill the planetarium's lobby, singing at the top of my register. Echoes shower into me. My spine feels ignited by them. New Florida is composed of grassy water, the bleached reefs of submerged and abandoned cities, and dozens of floating villages. It's illegal to live here, although thousands of us do. Holdouts and the spawn of holdouts. Old Florida is a glassy figment in the minds of the soon-to-be-deceased. If you think our song is monotonous, you should hear our neighbors reminiscing. Oh, the highways, the indoor malls, soil as far as a man could travel. Funerals, remember those? The coffins we planted like seeds in the ground. That Florida, if it ever existed, has no reality for me. We go mazing between the toppled condominiums, which look like dark whelks lying on their sides. Golden awnings bloom on the former city's northern border. The tenanted ruins rise in the west. Generator lights glow in several of the third and fourth story windows. My passenger turns on the bow seat and shouts over my singing. Miss, didn't we just come from that tunnel? Are we going in circles? Yes, I call down, enjoying my height. It's the only way out. Satellites have been down for half a century. Even those who navigate with salvaged equipment fail to detect the dangers hidden under the water. Perhaps these vintage technologies work on sleepier seas. I have only ever lived here. 
My sisters and I navigate these margins with breath and bones. We sing, and we absorb the echoes into our skeletons. A map draws itself inside us, revises us. Three hard strokes. Break. Sit and paddle around a forest of streetlights. Launching my voice against a wall, I can hear the sunken pylons that mean to kill me, and I swerve, changing the future. This happens hundreds of times a day in New Florida. Lean back, I tell my passenger, and he folds himself into the gondola as if it's a casket, crossing his arms against the crinkling slicker. It ripples across him, and it's easy to pretend that I am transporting the sea itself, the wind made flesh. We enter the archway to a vanished city park, now a deep green pool. Smells change as we travel, rotting wood, salt-eaten aluminum. The song boomerangs around a flooded parking garage, once large enough to stable hundreds of cars. I close my eyes as we spin around a stone nautilus. Hiding just ahead of us is the decaying, waterlogged hulk of a poinciana tree blocking the exit. Echoes push its branching shape into my skull and into the skulls of my sisters in the distant, adjacent hangar. Always, we are this close and this remote. Vibrations unite us. We can hear the golden algae that gloves the underwater city and the long, bald stretches of sunlit wall. Spongy sounds and waffled ones. But tonight, the map is my own creation, the product of a single looping input. C stroke, J stroke, I brace the pole against my chest. The song hunts for an opening, and water spits us into unbroken sky. When I open my eyes, the man is staring up at me. Ah, I've heard about you, he smiles uncertainly. You're one of those bat girls, the echo locators. What luck, I smile back at him. I am. We call ourselves the gondoliers, four singing sisters pulling the canals of New Florida. There are other boats in the water, but only my sisters and I take passengers through Old City. According to Vi, when our mother was alive, people would count four girls seated behind her on the long skiff and reliably say, Trying for the boy? As a matter of fact, she'd snap, God has blessed me with daughters. If I could, I'd make a hundred more. My sisters tell this story all the goddamn time, so often that it feels like my memory. She drowned when I was three years old, before the cameras in my mind turned on. Our regulars suspect there's more to our nasally singing than we let on. For sure they know it's not Italian. Lady, can I please pay you to shut up? Tourists have begged me. I used to think that we were very special, the best boat women in the world. But Viola says no, we are only vessels ourselves. Something wants to be born. Perhaps there are many others like us around the bays of New Florida and elsewhere. Women who know enough to be silent about what is developing inside their bodies. This sensitivity grew in us softly, softly. I can only compare it to seeing in the dark. We sing and shapes tighten out of an interior darkness, edges and densities. Objects sing back at us. Turn hard left to avoid the fallen tree. Pull southwest to miss the gluey hill of floating garbage. Pillars thin as lampposts push fuzzily into our minds. A heartbeat later, they rear out of the bay, fatally real. Our mother could not echolocate, according to my sisters. When I was a child, I found this frightening and sad. Imagine seeing a thousand colors streaking the sky and realizing that your mother saw only one unbroken gray. But Viola says our mother could hear us crying from impressive distances. And now I wonder if she had some precursor of this ability. Our gift is not a true clairvoyance, or what I imagine that to be. There's no time for anything like that. It's more like a muscular intuition of what the water is going to do next. And with our poles flying, rattling the oarlocks, we move to accommodate the future of the river. You could be my age, I tell my new last fare. In the right lighting. Yes. He doesn't turn, but I hear his smile. Darkness is a real fountain of youth, isn't it? We slice under the mangroves, riding high with the outgoing tide. His narrow face looks even leaner inside the slicker, like a spade full of white clay. Nobody I know is so pale. We live on sunshine here, where the canals are inkwells of blinding light. Leaf freckles cover him and disappear again as we bob into the sun. I like knowing that my arms are the engine of this transformation, masking and unmasking him. But then I glimpse the real sea rolling beyond the bay, and I remember with a start, no, you really don't know anything about him. Only surfaces and angles. 
In this neighborhood of Bahia del Oro, pollution tints everything with phosphor. Mosses drop in shimmering clumps from the floating ore. I pull from starboard, my bare feet planted against the cypress boards. Orange plants with soft, drunken voices slide around the hull, drawing a beautiful lace behind my eyelids. I like your boat. Very pretty. The man's deep voice startles me and causes the shy plants to fall silent. He wraps a fist against the hull. I can hear the solidity of my gondola behind the hollowness of his compliment. Such an unusual design. Suck my dick. You can't say that to a paying customer, chides Viola in my mind. Suck my cock, I say instead. He slams a laugh into my chest. I haven't heard that one in decades. I write it on the wall of the flooded school, which is covered in the vanished teenager's hieroglyphs. Suck my dick, ride my dick, lick my juicy pussy. Names that are still legible at low tide. Paola was here. Gabriel was here. Say my name. Hurt like I do. Kiss me someone. Writing that survives the bodies that produced it is always haunted, I guess. But the underwater graffiti of the lost world feels especially so. I don't like false praise, I tell him. And I see that you have eyes. My gondola is decorated with crude stars that I knifed into the wood. The end result was less like artwork than an attack my boat survived. My boat looks nothing like my sister's perfectly lovely gondolas, and that is how I wanted it. After that, there is a long silence. The sun seems to tarry behind the trees, extending our opportunity to beg it to stay. Bright water ripples around either side of us, and the black mangroves slant off into the distance. Do you live on Bahia del Oro, sir? I've never seen you out here. No, you haven't. That is certainly by design. What a feat. A recluse among recluses. You don't like false praise. I don't like false people. I choose my company carefully. Undeterred, the man taps at the steel ornament fixed to the bow, my birthday bird, welded for me by Luna as a counterbalance to my weight in the stern. Your work? My sister Luna made it for me. She's the family artist. The heron is painted a somber Madonna blue, my only criticism of it. Turquoise would have been my choice, I tell him. Turquoise is what that blue would look like if she divorced the knight and went on a fabulous vacation. He laughs again, a laugh which I bounce back at him from the same low frequency. Warmth stirs in my belly. Do you gondoliers ever take a vacation? Oh, never. I feel like I'm always working, even when I'm sleeping. Our beds are practically floating. Our home sits half in the water. Home. It sounds like a foreign word, the way he intones it. Where is home? It's taboo to ask this question of a stranger in New Florida, but perhaps he does not know our etiquette. I have a bad thought, staring at his bony face, but I can answer him without fear, because he is very close to the end of his life. We live in an old seaplane hangar. Almost like a cave. Perfect for a bad girl. Water laps inside it. You should see the four of us, rowing home at night, like horses swimming into a barn stall. He smiles at me strangely, his eyes crossing a little. Horses? Have you ever seen a horse? I shake my head, embarrassed. Only in books with waterlogged pictures. Stories fly out of the mouths of my oldest neighbors. But I have never seen a swimming horse myself, it's true. Tell me, when were you born? I whisper the year to him, and something like awe crosses his face. How lucky! So you remember nothing then? None of the evacuations, none of the flooding, none of the floating bodies? His face puckers and relaxes. A quick civil war. You don't remember any of that. I know what my older sisters tell me, I say. It's almost like a memory. And what do they tell you? Very little. We skirt the cathedral, half hidden behind the shivering leaves of the mangroves. A brass steeple soars over the trees, a canted X on which several anhingas dry their wings. Framed by the sun, their glossy feathers look emerald. Hundreds more roost around the ruins. Snake birds, the ocean swans, egrets, pelicans, herons. Someone lives here now, it seems. Rope ladders tumble down the walls. As we glide under the cathedral window, a dog begins to bark. We are only allowed to stay here, says Viola, because officially we don't exist. Most mainlanders have forgotten us. 
New Florida has been declared a wasteland, which is a hilariously inaccurate term in my opinion, when the southern marshes are brimming with fish and reptiles and birds. A resurrection, say the old timers. But for me, it's the world as it has always been. We're almost there, I keep promising the man. I don't like the way the eastern clouds are rumbling. Twenty minutes, I say. The standard lie. Like a cracker you hand people to put off their appetite. Every twenty minutes, you repeat this increment. But his impatience seems to burn off him as soon as we pull away from Old City. He begins to hum along with my singing. A beautiful surprise, like someone walking beside me, taking my hand. Look, he says dreamily, and points to where the moon is rising, bright and enormous as the door to another galaxy on the opposite side of the bay. Ooh! A whiskery sun flashes between the sunken rooftops, but dark clouds have rolled in from the southeast. A bad surprise. I imagine my sisters pointing up at them, shaking their heads. Do you feel that? His frowning face retreats inside the cowl. Glimmering threads begin to fall. A hissing starts in the back of my brain. Rain is no good. Rain scatters the echoes. I can feel the massing thunderheads like gloved hands at my back, pushing me to go faster and faster. The current is moving us steadily seaward, at a speed of perhaps 15 knots. The clouds racing toward us give me a tingling deja vu, and I realize it's a sky I've seen in dreams, lowering itself into my home. I wasn't yet born when the ocean rode across the peninsula. The great floods happened before Bahia Rosa was Bahia Rosa, back when everything had a different name. But I can hear the waves rearing back, slamming forward, causing the walls to buckle. The cries of the abandoned families, the ambulance boats with their droning sirens, my older sisters become quite agitated when I describe these dreams. You have no idea what it was like then, Vi told me. You never lived a day on land. Quit stealing our stories. Perhaps the memories filtered into me through our mother's blood, I once suggested to my sisters. Viola, in her most condescending voice, then told me to leave the grieving to the grown-ups. She still thinks of me as her three-year-old ward. It will shock her someday to look up and discover that I am an adult now, with secrets of my own. The algae. I hold up the flat of my oar. You see? It's changing color. Brownish gold to reddish pink. Which means we are drawing very near the seawall. The worst pollution seems to be concentrated under the blooms. Do you ever see mutants out this way? The man asks me, turtled in his hood. He keeps his voice nonchalant, but I watch him peering into the darkening water. You hear tales of goliath groupers with multicolored eyes, two-headed manatee calves. Never once. Does that disappoint you? In fact, when I first entered Bahia Rosa, I found something even stranger. But I don't tell the man this. Why burden him with a new fear, when we are finally sitting level on the water? Part 2. The Bridge One slow afternoon last May, I found myself in the middle of Bahia Rosa, for two hours, I'd been tailing a dolphin through the polluted zone, reasoning that if she could breathe here, so could I. When I reached the outermost limits of our territory, where the black buoys warned boaters to turn back, I pushed onward. By this point, the dolphin had disappeared, but I'd already traveled so far from home that it seemed obligatory to continue exploring. My sisters could feel the growing distance between us, but there was nothing they could do about it. They were working in Old City, two hours behind me. Long before I saw the seawall, I heard it lifting out of the ocean. At last it appeared, a thick hallucination striping the ruddy bay. I knew the stories, but I'd never seen this fossil for myself. Here it was, rising out of the ocean, a monument to its own failure. This mile-long section was largely intact, with bright, moving gaps where the maroon water had eaten through the crumbling stone. First I heard, and then saw, what must have been the seawall's former landside edge. It curled toward me, as if uninformed that the land had pulled away, and it was easy to imagine the whole peninsula slipping out of this relaxed embrace and sinking. What must have once been solid, unbroken coastline in our mother's youth was now a pointillist landscape of small tree islands. Many were less than one acre wide, knuckles of limestone covered in flowering vegetation. I had been hugging their muddy shorelines for the past hour. Now. I let the springy echoes from the seawall choreograph my passage into deeper water. 
As smoothly as a happy thought turns black, I found myself in the middle of Bahia Rosa, where the algae waved in every direction. The absence of birdsong made the sky feel empty and tall. A stinging odor lifted off the water. Almost immediately, I developed a terrible headache. I found the dead spot, or it found me, just as I pulled up to the huge, broken molars of the seawall's northern end. Three hundred yards behind me, the bald mangroves lifted onto their tiptoes as if they, too, were surprised to find this barrier still standing. I could hear its secret skeleton, the weep holes and the reinforcement rods. I heard as well the gargling cracks where the wall had failed at the waterline. Pointy barnacles covered the eroded stone, dissipating my song. It seemed possible that in another hundred years they might fuse together into a single, speckled shell. I was pulling through a pocket of dense red algae that had collected around the wall's concave edge when something astonishing happened to me. The echoes ceased entirely. My sister's singing fell away, and I was alone. The suddenness of this silence shocked me more than any detonation could have done. The deep sonority of our chorus vanished. All I could hear was a single, flattened cry. This, I realized, was my voice, separated from the others. Fear spun around me. What had happened to my sisters? Somehow, it seemed, I had pulled out of range. I was floating in a kind of dead spot. I watched the waves collapsing into the limestone wall for miles and miles, a birdless sky stretching above me. Nothing sang back to me. The present seemed to spill eternally around me, and no echoes reached my ears. I removed my clothes and slid into the toxic water. I don't know what possessed me to do this, but it was no accident. I pushed my head below the surface, through the slippery blooms, kicking down. I'd never felt this far removed from my sisters. Under the water, I stopped hearing even the whoosh of my blood. What happened next, I'll never know, because I sank out of earshot of my thoughts. I surfaced to a grogginess that exceeded anything I'd ever felt in my waking life. A ruff of pearly blue sea scum encircled me. The plants floating here seemed to emit their own red glow a light independent of any moon. The raw throats of cypress trunks scraped the sky. I didn't know who I was, what I was. The face floating on the water was not mine, not yet. It wrinkled and smoothed with a foreign serenity. Nothing remembered me. The seawater I spit out tasted poisonous. Creature-like, I watched my limbs moving through it. I could name the colors of the bay before I knew what sort of animal I was. An acrid smell lifted off the water, impossible to ignore at low tide, bringing with it visions of putrefying flesh. A smell that should have been incompatible with my bliss, but somehow was not. How interesting, I thought from a great distance, rolling my arms through the rosy water, turning onto my back. Sensation returned conveys none of the extraordinary pain I felt coming to consciousness. My joints began to pulse. A bad sunburn crackled across the mask of my face. When I heard the waves slapping against my gondola, memories swept through me. I was Janelle Picaro again, one of four gondoliers, afloat in the forbidden waters of Bahia Rosa. My sisters. Queasily, I swam for my gondola. The seawall loomed on the horizon, and once I pulled out of the dense algae, I could hear them again. Viola, Mila, Luna, seeping back into my skull, a wailing harmony. Only then did I take the measure of what I had done. Just this once, I thought, once and never again. This magic phrase inoculated me against my guilt. I pulled the red weeds from my hair and bailed water from the boat. I didn't know that I was setting a precedent. It felt like coming back from the dead that night, rowing into the seaplane hangar under a full moon. My sisters were very angry with me. They wanted to know where I'd been. Those heavy tones fell into me like lead weights after the freedom of the afternoon. The lie was spontaneous. Ordinarily, it is very difficult to lie to my sisters, but the dead spot had inspired me. Without thinking, I screamed back at them, swinging my oar, striking at bedrock. Using tone alone, I changed the night's direction. Where were you? I counter-accused. Why didn't anybody answer me? I began to sob. I let them witness the release of so much blackness from my body, recalling the silence that had flooded me while I was floating under the wavy ceiling of algae. I was calling and calling for you. I have never felt so all alone on the water. The best lies have a fleck of truth folded inside them. All good performers know this. Real gold to bite down on. 
The ringing truth overrides the hollowness of the lie. I could see from my sister's horrified expressions that they believed me. The transfer of my guilt into their bodies was a success. I even began to believe myself. My sisters apologized to me. They blamed the weather, interference from the scattered raindrops. We embraced. My relief could not have been more sincere. That night, I lay awake for hours in an itchy reverie, curling my toes on the bed railing. We sleep in cots stanchioned to the walls. Luna's body was the lump in the cot above mine. Mila was snoring down below. Waves lapped into the hangar. Never again, I promised my sleeping sisters. I could always return to the dead spot in my memory. It was enough to know that kind of quiet existed. I went to sleep feeling warm and lucky, grateful for the strange experience and snug in my conviction that I would never repeat it. Seven hours later, I was pulling back toward the dead spot. Part three, the dead spot. We vowel down the channels. Darkness reaches around the eastern skyscrapers and then those stalagmites are behind us. A pink line stitches day to night. A few early stars have appeared, but that light tells me nothing about our position. Unless I am singing, I really can't tell south from north after dark. Barking seagulls scatter the echoes, and I get caught in a swirling cul-de-sac of water on the outskirts of Old City. Crackling into my body, I hear my sister's voices combing the darkening bay like searchlights. Ah! Disappearing can make you feel like your own biographer. You hear the absence of your voice, and the notes you are failing to hit make their own shadow melody. You unlid the spaces ordinarily hidden by your body. A new song comes fluting through them. Whenever I hear my sister singing without me, I get a flash of my own silhouette. I bounce back a B-flat at the top of my register. The note quivers there, reassuring them. I am alive in Old City. The song lines connecting us pull tight. Relax. I hear a pulsing silence. My sister's listening as I move away from them. When I return, I will pile money on the table. I will give my sisters hundreds of reasons to forgive me. What will Viola say, I wonder, when I tell her I've made more in a night than she makes in a summer month in Bahia del Oro? My passenger cranes around to stare at me, wearing the oddest look. The slicker lays heavily on top of him, alien as frog skin. It seems to breathe on its own. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O. I stare down at him, stirring the gold from the bay. You sound like you're calling pigs to the trough, he says, but he is smiling. I like this man. He fixes me with a lolling curiosity, despite his urgency to reach the seawall. He does not offer to help me to row the gondola, as some of the nervous men do. He does not snap at me when I pause to rest my voice. His eyes are mild. He is turning his palms, catching the fat droplets of rain. Were you born with the ability? He asks. Or is it something you taught yourself out here? I feel the song idling in my belly, changing slyly inside me. Both, I think. People talk about heredity as if it's linear and vertical, dead people passing things down to the young. But my sisters and I are evolving together, I tell the man. All day we swap notes around. We blur our voices into one song. Something grows in the fast-moving channels between us, and it's changing all the time. It moves with us, this thing we are inheriting. To our left, ivory columns stand guard over a submerged pavilion. That was a bank once, I tell him. Did you see the vault in the middle of the floor? Ferns are curling around it now. Can you believe that? People kept their money at a great distance from their body. I believe it, he says. But... I'm quite a bit older than you. My oldest sister Viola says, You youngsters only know the stories. His tone is wistful, but I hear the scolding note. My sisters and I are no strangers to this attitude. Older passengers often seem dismayed that they have to cede the earth to creatures like us. They are aghast that we know so little about their world, and bewildered by our happiness in this one. We know more than you can imagine, I want to tell him. But... Not as badly as I want my tip. I wish that I remembered the land, for what it's worth, I tell the man, watching his pale eyes swim over my face. I would have loved to know what my mother's yard looked like. Yard. He looks up at me thoughtfully. What an odd word. I never noticed that before. 
Don't mind me, miss. You should forget even the stories. Look how lightly you sit on the water, remembering only water. I picture the healthy eel grass waving in the limpid shallows of Bahia de las Nubes. The grass is always greener, I guess. He laughs at that. Where did he hear that one? I'm surprised that it even survived the floods. You know all our corny sayings. You're like a jukebox, miss. His face reminds me of the wild dogs we see on the tree islands, panting with silent laughter. He speaks in a monotone, so I don't know if I should be complimented or insulted. Perhaps I'm being invited to laugh with him. A joke box. A juke box. It was a machine that played the same stale songs over and over. Blood rushes into my face. Does he think that's what I'm doing? Repeating myself? Can't he hear my singing changing on the air? We crane up at the washed violet sky behind the rotten ceiling. The bank shrinks into the distance. When the stranger turns, his face is as composed as a poem, its symmetries perfectly mysterious. My fantasies don't run in his direction. But fear prickles my neck, and it feels almost like lust. Hey, what's your name? I ask him. Who are you going to meet in Bahia Rosa, where nobody lives? He gapes up at me, his Adam's apple jumping. I feel the oddest deja vu. Make up a name for me. Any name you'd like. Give me a nickname while you're at it. I'm always in the market for a new name. Hmm, let me think on it, I tell him. Maybe we can borrow a name from the posters. I say this to make a joke and wind up frightening myself. The missing person posters flap against the walls of Old City, most bleached beyond recognition. Men and women and children who disappeared in the floods. There is no way to read them as anything but obituaries today. Ah, the posters. Yes, I've seen those. A missing person. How perceptive you are. That's me to a T. He turns back to the light rain fizzing on the water, his hairy knuckles wrapped around the heron's throat. I've retreated into my own thoughts when he calls back. All of those faces are my face, why not? All of those names can be me. We are fungible sponges, we missing people. I can't get my bearings in this conversation. Is he joking? Is he really a missing person? Were you here for the floods? He stares at me for a long moment before answering. I'm part of a dying breed, Batgirl. An old Floridian. I grew up on a street called Coral Way, in a house with a foundation. But you stayed. No, miss. We fled. I was in the first wave of evacuations. But I wanted to come home before I died, to see my home again. His laugh becomes the phlegmy cough. I need a scuba suit to find it, I guess. I've been here for three weeks and I can't find a trace of that life. It does not surprise me that I have a neighbor whose face I've never seen. Millions of people once lived in the coastal cities. Thousands of us remain. Squatters rights, bro. Someone spray painted on the tallest standing condominium in Old City. But property disputes are rare on moving, glowing water. You have to live here to discover that the pollution isn't strong enough to kill you. Where are you moored? I've been camping at the university, on the roof of the library, I believe. It's a good retirement home. The twilight zone for my twilight years. Come on, you're not that old. We laugh together, a sound I often draw like a tarpaulin over what I do not understand. Down here, the world has already ended. It's very peaceful in its way. It always surprises me when visitors treat New Florida as if it's a graveyard. Our home is no afterlife, no wasteland. Not an hour earlier, we pulled through a rookery that shook with the hungry sobs of fledgling birds, wood stork chicks and starry white ibis, and little green herons wading around the rooftop's thoughts. But if my passenger failed to hear them, I doubt my voice can convince him that our world is newborn. Do you have a family, sir? Up north? I did. A wife, two sons, terrestrials, all. They must be worried about you. Do they know where you are? They drowned. Oh. I'm so sorry. I killed them, he elaborates. I was one of the marine engineers who designed the seawall. I don't blame you, I blurt out. You should. People my age are criminals. We ruined the world. 
Reminiscing about his guilt seems, perversely, to cheer my passenger. His voice brightens as he describes the scale of the failure. We built the wall to withstand winds of 150 miles per hour. Does that sound naive to you? I wonder if he can hear the note of pride inside of what he seems to mean as an apology to me. It's a bloated, underwater sound. He's chosen a funny moment to have this conversation, I think, with the wind picking up all around us and rain slanting between our faces. You failed, I nod. It seems to be the line he's written for me to say. Our imaginations failed us. Our models failed us. A smile is still playing at the corners of his mouth. I wonder if he knows he's smiling. There is a profoundly unchaperoned quality to his gaze now that his mind has traveled back in time. I try to listen to the details of his story, but it's his slack, abandoned face that fascinates me. His eyes roll up to the gray clouds as if something is dragging him skyward by the roots of his hair. We all knew the end was coming. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It would be cruel, I decide, to remind him that life is flourishing in New Florida, that it is our world now, not his any longer, that actually he is the one who is dying. This used to be paradise. I'm sorry, little bat. We ate up the whole horizon. We left you a ghost town, not even a town, a toxic sloth. This is our home, I tell him, and we are not ghosts. I stop pulling and stare at him. Water rolls along his slicker, capturing the light, as if the green skin is sweating for him. In his voice, I hear a longing for release so close to my own that it is almost unbearable. There is a place I like to go, I hear myself say, to fall silent. As I describe the dead spot to him, he listens in perfect stillness. Even his blinking slows. Several times I hear him swallowing his coughs. It feels like a betrayal to entrust my secret to this man when I've told none of my sisters. But almost anything I say to them provokes a terrible reverb, whereas the stranger is an open field. No buried stalagmites, no love lost between us, no history, and no expectation of a future. These turn out to be the perfect acoustics for confessing a secret on which I do not actually wish to reflect. And you don't think the pollution is damaging you? He asks at last. Deranging you, I hear. No. The skin under my breasts begins to burn. Not really. An odd rash has spread silently over my belly, unnoticed by anyone. Even I forget it's there during the daylight hours. My hands remember it at night. You choose to swim here, he says, and the world's most toxic waters. It hasn't affected us. Hasn't it, little bat? It's affecting all of us. He drums his knuckles on his temple, his smile softening like something boiling at the bottom of a pot. His voice curls inward so that it seems he is talking mostly to himself. The gondoliers, the birds of Chernobyl. What does that mean? Nothing. A bad joke. Algae drags behind us like an old-fashioned wedding train. You have to sweep the lantern over it to arouse the red glow. The unlit bay is entirely black now. Soon, I will deposit this person on the seawall, I think, with relief. Then, I will go night swimming. I imagine the water closing over my head, swallowing me into it, the feeling that this water is gestating me, my secret life. So secret that for whole minutes, I know nothing about it. We drift while I rest my voice. Very gingerly, the man lowers his left arm into the algae. Then he drops his soaking hand into his lap where it looks like a netted white fish. I watch him frowning down at the hand as if waiting for it to change before his eyes. Tell me something, he asks. Why do you keep returning to this dead spot? For some reason, I feel myself blushing. Uh, I'm the youngest in our family. My sister Vi was like a mother to me. At the hour of my death, I'll still be the baby sister to them. It doesn't seem like I can age out of that role. This is certainly part of why I feel entitled to my lonely hours in the dead spot, I explained to the man. Their entire life before my birth is a secret from me, whereas everything I've ever done has been visible to them. Out here, I float into my own element. When I am silent, when I am alone, I feel free. I don't have to sing along with anybody. Even my thoughts stop. Under the water, far from my sisters, outside the chaos of our breaths. Only then, 
when I am nothing to anyone, do I feel the great peace. It's as if I've released something living into the narrow gondola. I picture the secret floating between our faces, a jellyfish emitting its soft, violet light, blowing open and shut. I wait for the man to turn it into a joke or to shame me for coming here alone. Yes, he says quietly. That's it exactly. What a discovery. The man lifts his eyes to mine with naked surprise, and I feel equally astonished. The longer we stare at each other, the louder a pure tone grows inside the gondola. Audible, I think, to both of us. He pushes back the green hood, smoothing the wet leaves of his hair. Gray or brown, there's no telling in this lighting. His wide smile sends all his wrinkles into hiding. Who doesn't dream of it? The silence that blots up thought? The silence that frees one from the burden of being oneself? This smile is like a portal back to the stranger's childhood. Every prior grin I've seen tonight, I realize, was a counterfeit of this one. Understanding someone can make you feel understood in turn, and I smile back at him to let him know that we have this thirst in common. It occurs to me that I should thank this white-faced man, the marine engineer, along with everyone from the last century who heard the water coming and failed to stop it. The dead spot is their creation. We gondoliers operate by the golden rule. You do not take any risk you wouldn't want your sister to take. You don't pull into bad weather or shoot the tunnels at low tide. You refuse any passenger who might overpower you. I would kill my sisters, for example, if they risked their lives to take a fare to Bahia Rosa. My sisters and I all pretend to live by this code, to prize safety over profit. But I have always felt quietly certain that perfect adherence to the golden rule would sink our business. We'd never leave the hangar. When I started breaking this rule routinely, it was easy enough to rationalize. I needed a darkness that would have killed the others, and they needed me to keep it a secret from them. This did not feel treacherous. Not at first. It felt like a loving choice. People will tell you that Bahia Rosa is a fatal place, but for months, it was my paradise. The black-walled horizons, the silence that let me ripple out of my body until at last, I felt entirely at peace, whole and unfractured, one with the wildest turnings of the universe. But at the same time, I had to wonder, pulling home from the dead spot, how true can the sensation of unity really be if you need to leave everyone you care about to get it? We float over a school of Pompano, dozens of frozen gray faces skipping in front of the bow light. Something has frightened them. I glimpse a long body saucering beneath the transom. The man beckons me down from my platform. When he asks his question, his words quiver like the fishes. Do you and your sisters ever hear the voices of the drowned in this bay? No, sir, that's not... We don't have that kind of range. I see. He nods, but I don't think he believes me. The man helps me by bailing water, leaning carefully forward. His green slicker bunches around the stringy muscles of his shoulders. The humming grows inside me until there is no room for worry. What will it feel like, I wonder, to enter the dead spot with another person? To fall silent with him? He thinks my home is a cemetery, and I want him to hear how wrong he is before we part company. The end of his life is not the end of all life. Something wants to be born. We pass the line of black buoys. They strain after us on their long tethers like dogs sniffing at the gondola. Just as quickly, they are lost to sight. Their nodding heads push against the back of my mind as I sing. Ooh. For a long time, we see nothing at all, only water and more water. But I reassure the man that I can hear the seawall drawing nearer with each boomeranging note of my song. And then we both see it, the bleached wall, looming like a motionless wave on the dark horizon. I touch my tongue to the inside of my cheek. For hours, I've been waiting for this moment. But now that the end is in sight, I don't see how I'm going to manage the pivot. It's impossible to imagine leaving this sick man alone on the seawall with no supplies, no fresh water tantamount to pushing him off a roof on a night like this. The nausea I felt back at the jetty returns with a force that nearly doubles me over. We shadow the soft shoulders of the tree islands, where I hear the curly voices of laughing yellow, snarling green vegetation. 
In twenty minutes, I tell the man, we will reach the former land side edge of his wall. But when we are perhaps three hundred yards to the northwest of the seawall's rocky edge, the rain begins to fall in earnest. It pounds into my skull, drawing a cowl around the gondola. More water splits the sky. In an instant, the map inside me dissolves. If I were home right now, I'd be listening to this storm drumming on the metal roof. Luna would be snoring above me, Mila below me. I'd be drifting off myself under the blankets at the beginning of a dream. Can my sisters still hear me? I hear nothing but rain. I swing my light across the chop and feel the stirrings of real panic. By sight alone, in such a punishing crosswind, there is no way I can make this passage. Viola! Mila! Luna! My voice flies off and does not return. Nothing answers me. Nothing steers me here. I place the pole in its mount and climb down from the platform. Perhaps my poker face is not on straight, because the man gives me a wild look and grabs my wrist. Why aren't you singing? Forgive me, sir, I say, avoiding his eyes. I made a mistake. I thought we could beat this storm, but I'm losing my voice. I can't map the channel. If I miscalculate the passage, we'll capsize. On a slack tide, I explained to him, I'd shortcut across the bay, but the water is alive with eddies and I don't want to get smashed against the wall or sucked out to the gulf. Girl, he says slowly, take me to the goddamn wall. His voice shakes with a rage I could not have predicted even a heartbeat earlier. I can see it. We could swim there, practically. No, we can't risk it. His face is almost unrecognizable to me, winched tight with anger. I won't risk it, I clarify, because it's suddenly clear to me that he is making very different calculations. You won't risk it? You'll bathe in poison, but this is too dangerous? The man tugs me toward him, shouting over the wind. Tonight is the anniversary of the storm surge. Do they teach that history in your floating schools? I had forgotten the date. It isn't one we celebrate. The night the pumping systems failed. The night the seawall was breached by the towering water. The wailing night that did not kill our mother, who would live for another seven years so that I could be born. He tightens his grip on my wrist, gazing at the spot beyond the bow light where the angled rain is steadily visible. Horror seeps into me. His or my own, I am no longer certain. Large chunks of darkness lift and fall around my gondola. I traveled a thousand miles to die here. I chose this spot, this date. I wanted to walk across my wall on my last night on Earth. That was my wish, to die at home on the anniversary of my children's deaths. Beneath the sagging hood, he peers up at my face. Here is a man who has written the last scene of his life, I realize who is furious that his stage directions are getting eaten by the wind. His voice lowers, and inside of the anger, I can hear a grinding disappointment. Don't hold out on me, miss. It's cruel to stop here within sight of our destination. I didn't come this close to the end to turn around. Our destination. Rain pounds into the hull. Water we should be bailing. His feet are bare, I notice. At some point, he must have removed his boots. The toes waggle up at me, as if their good humor is still intact, even as the rest of him seems bent on destroying us. When the rain stops, I'm turning around. I let out a shaky breath. I cannot, in good conscience, take you to your death. But miss, he laughs angrily, reaching a wet palm to my cheek. You already have. Look around you. We've arrived. The scolding note re-enters his voice. Now, be honest. You knew where you were taking me. The dead spot, you called it. Raindrops go jumping off the green slicker, outlining him in fizzing silver. Get your pole. Finish the job I hired you to do. No! I climb back onto the platform and begin to turn us toward the lee side of the nearest tree island, which I can just make out through the rain. When I look again, the man is standing in the stern. We ride up one swell and down into a deep trough and I have time to feel amazed that we did not capsize just before the man lunges at me. He must be a better echolocator than I am. When my arms lift, his arms shadow them, a rhyming motion. 
Quite easily, he wrestles the pole away from me. He gives me a terrible grin, gripping my pole to his chest. Sisters, I was wrong about my last fare. He is stronger than I am, and he is so much sicker than I imagined. Since you refuse to continue, I'm taking command of this vessel. Warm liquid seeps through my trousers, and I'm crying now. I want to go home. Ooh! I scream. The man releases my arm. For a moment, his eyes shine with some trace of our earlier understanding. Poor little bat. You just wanted to disappear for a little while, didn't you? You don't actually want to die. I don't. I don't, but I had to come a great distance to learn that, sisters. You should stop swimming out here then. Again, I hear the scolding note, but it's much fainter now. He is trying, clumsily, to push off the rocky bottom and turn the gondola toward the seawall. I watch him struggling with the push pole, its foot now choked with mud. This whole bay is a stomach full of bile. Then comes a rippling instant where the scene I am imagining becomes the action I am taking. I watch my hands reach out to grab the pole back, my fingers closing just above his knuckles. He doesn't let go, but twists around with a cry. I crawl forward and bite at his hands, missing but causing him to howl. He is still clutching my pole when a strong wave washes over the stern, unbalancing us both. I let go to brace myself, and the man falls backward into the rainy water. I scream with him as he falls, and I go on screaming after he splashes into the bay. But I don't jump into the churning water after him, terrified that he will drag me down. I don't reach my pole out to him, because I don't have a pole now. It went overboard with the stranger. I croak at the water. Sir? My voice is almost gone. It occurs to me that I don't even know what name to call. It's so dark that I can't see where the man surfaces, but I hear his arms crashing heavily through the algal mats. He is swimming away from me, I realize with relief. He is trying to make the wall. If I were to swivel the lantern, perhaps I would find him bobbing mere feet from the boat, his pale face staring up at me, wreathed in glowing algae. Perhaps I could save him. Save him, I command myself, but I don't move from the floor of the gondola. Instead, I cover my light, and I wish only for the slapping sounds to stop. Eventually, my wish is granted. The splashing ceases. Either the man has drowned, or he's swum out of earshot. The new silence is soaked through with his absence. I lie flat on the wet wards, pushing my fists against my stomach. My pole, I imagine, must be riding these same waves into the gulf or sinking to some depth I cannot hear. And my passenger? He is a true missing person now, I think. A special amphibian, dead and alive to anyone who knows him. The last splash he made is a sound that will not leave me. You killed him, I try not to think. The moon shines into my eyes. Very slowly, it occurs to me that the rain has stopped. I have a peculiar, nerveless awareness of the water's trembling surface. Where am I? My mind is like the sky between the stars, void of shapes, names, facts, but I don't need to sing to guess. Part 4. The Chorus I stare up at a busy construction pit. Tiny white spades are tossing huge quantities of darkness around. Stars. These are the stars. I am not sure how long I drift like this, trying not to think about the terrible splashing. Without my pole, I'm in bad trouble, but I screamed for so long that I must have blasted all feeling from my body, and it hardly seems to matter that no boats will find me in the distant bay. My bow light plucks at the stringy algae. Perhaps I sailed right through a break in the seawall without realizing it. My song is a pitiful hissing, and it returns no depths or distances to me. When I hear a woman's voice rising out of the darkness, I think it must be my imagination. My light swings in the direction of the singing. A gondola is arrowing toward me, flat-bottomed and opal-white in the powerful beam of my lantern. My good feeling immediately flips into horror. A gondolier stands on the polling platform, her hair blowing loose, the pitch of her singing rises. God, please, no. God, please, keep us separate. No, 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 I am not ready to meet her. Ooh, she sings at me. Can this be possible? Am I about to run into my doppelganger? My double, polling out of the past or the future? Perhaps the man will be seated in her bow, smiling out of his green slicker. Will he be dead, I wonder, or alive? But it's not my double that draws into view, it's my sister. Viola glides silently past me, wearing a blindfold with trailing ribbons, her slack face illuminated by the gray orb of her bow light. Her droning song floods into me, 
I hear the same sound that pours from my throat in the dead spot, an emptying hiss, like grain spilling from a sack. Her gondola moves much faster than my mind does. Lethargic thoughts chase each other in slow, widening circles. She's come out here to find me. She's put herself in terrible danger, all to find me. But soon, I realize that Vi has no idea that I'm near her. The blindfold is a trick of last resort. Tight pressure across the temples can sometimes help us hear better in bad weather. It doesn't seem to be working. Her hair flies raggedly out behind her. Her singing has the strange, flayed quality of all sounds in the dead spot, shadowless and flat. Now I hear, with excruciating clarity, how much trouble we're in for. Vi didn't come out here to save me. She's lost herself. Vi! I scream, too hoarse I'm sure to be heard. But Viola unties the red bandage around her eyes, using the blindfold to wipe at her face. Had all the drowned risen up to address me tonight, I could not have been more astonished. Shaking her hair out, she turns and looks right at me. Blister! Fury wheels around our boats, shrieking at such an ear-splitting volume that it's impossible to pinpoint the origin of the feeling. She pulls up to me, our pupils shrinking in the doubled glare of the bow lights. Two voices swing out like hooks, each catching at the other. What are you doing here? The answer floats between us, mocking us. Vi has always seemed to be light years ahead of me. Perhaps she is as surprised as I am to discover how we overlap. Did you come here to find me? Vi asks me in a stricken voice. Her face seems to float, unanchored, isolated by the light. I think about lying, then shake my head. No, I wanted to come out here to swim. So did I, says my sister with the ghost of a smile. Our calamity strikes me, suddenly, as terribly funny. No less astonishing a coincidence in its way than being born into the same family. How long have you been swimming here? Oh, Vi says pensively, chewing on her thumb pad. Years. Years! One of us asks, why didn't you tell me? One of us says to the other, it is so selfish to come here. One of us is burning with shame. Is it hers or my own? One of us shouts, who am I hurting? And we scream at each other, me! Silence rips apart down the middle. Silence reveals its tiny serrated fangs. Have we loved each other well? Could we love each other better? I realize that there is so much we have never told one another and likely never will. Secrets multiply throughout our hangar. A hundred doors that we refuse to test with speech. A hundred others that we pretend are walls. If I were braver, I would fling my voice against them at the exact pitch to pick the locks. If I were braver, and if I were a better singer. In a whisper, I tell Viola about my last fare. How I listened, paralyzed, while the moment when I might have saved him flipped into the moment of his death. To my great surprise, she does not pull away from me. I watch the story fall into her open pupils and prepare myself for Vi's disgust, her anger. But it's love, uninjured, that floats to the surface. It's a shame we weren't alive then, Vi murmurs. We could have told them how to build the seawall. We could have listened for the weak spots. Over her shoulder, I see a rolling darkness. I have the nauseating thought that the man's green slicker might come floating our way, carrying the glow of algae. Can you hear anything out there, Vi? Just you, talking, but let's keep trying. I crawl into Vi's gondola and hitch my boat to her stern. We try and fail to find a signal. The rain returns, lashing the black water between our boats. Soon, she too loses her voice. This rain stings wherever it touches our skin. Vi gives up on pulling and sits in the stern behind me. I feel the weight of her chin on my left shoulder. She runs the flats of her palms down my curved spine, pressing at the bony knobs. This is how sisters tune one another, she used to tell me when I was small, to spare my pride when I woke up afraid from a dream and needed her to hold me. I wonder if we will ever reach the end of the dead spot. It seems to keep spinning us back into it, a hungry red mouth. Blister, Vi says in her flattened voice, do you remember the mice? We had a single children's book when I was growing up with a superficially cheerful apocalyptic plotline. One mouse after another tumbles into a muddy hole, each trying to rescue the others. A family of mice doomed by their clumsiness and by their love, perhaps by a secret wish to save themselves. And saved they must have been by some tractor pull of grace because no children's book ends with the death of every protagonist. But my mind cannot conceive of a way out of our predicament. 
In fact, my mind has become the whole. Are we going to die now? Vi asks me. I shake my head, touched that she's sought out my opinion. Another milestone. We should never have come here, Vi shudders. I am sure they are out looking for us. Mila and Luna. Perhaps we'll hear their voices soon, behind the curtain of rain. I think about the storybook mice, steering a teacup on the high seas. In a family of sisters, everybody gets to play all the parts, the brave ones and the cowards, the doomed ones and the saviors. We toss our raw voices into the wind. We are rowing sightlessly, possibly in circles, as the keening begins. When the first echo reaches me, I mistake it for a symptom of exhaustion. Another echo returns to me, although my lips are sealed. Listen, Vi says, tugging at my elbow. I hear it too, you're not crazy. Or we're both crazy. Behind me, I hear Viola tense. The ocean is breaking into pieces. New pairs of eyes shine up at us below the gunwales, fluorescent, enormous discs, orange and purple and salt white, inlaid in the angular faces of some schooling species I have never seen before. I know the old stories about dolphins saving humans, but these are not dolphins, and they seem wholly oblivious of us, even as their keening penetrates our bones. A humming enters my chest and begins to grow, a deep, marine roar. Vi wraps her arms around me, and I feel grateful for her heartbeat. I'd go mad in a second if I was hearing this alone. This new song is wrenching my mind wider than it wants to open, faster than I'm ready to go. I'm not ready! I scream hoarsely, because I can feel myself getting spun into something so much larger than I am, vibrating at a frequency that is not human. Echoes leap into us from dimensions that seem impossibly remote. Shivering treetops and submerged walls, the tiny bones of unborn animals. We hear the hollows, the where to goes, spaces in the ruins that cry out with the tides, this is not the end of the world. This is not the end of the world. Without turning, I can feel Vi's lips parting, preparing to sing along. Vi, Vi, I want to beg like a child, please wait for me. I had wanted to dissolve on my own terms, and only temporarily. If we go through this door, what will we become? Other singers push into my mind, the gibbering moon and the silver mangroves and the buried coral. I am afraid of the voices lifting out of the dark. I am afraid to join them, but perhaps we will have to, if we want to survive. That was the end of our story today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Virtual Campfire Stories, and I hope you'll come back for our final story. Even when the program has ended, you will still have access to all the stories I've read to you this summer in the YouTube playlist I mentioned in the intro. If you're interested in reading more of Karen Russell's work, whether it be Orange World or any of her other books, you can get it from the library. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you again next Monday. Bye!